Hello, this is Andy Miller with the Davidson Soil and Water Conservation District. It's my pleasure to tell you today about a contest that the Davidson Soil and Water Conservation District has sponsored for over 50 years for the sixth graders in Davidson County. This contest is an essay and poster contest that's designed to help students have a better awareness of the world around them and how the things that they do impact our world, either positively or negatively. This year, our topic for the essay and poster contest is we all live in a watershed. And today I want to tell you about the contest and hopefully give you some ideas for things that you either might include in your essay or in your poster as we work through this contest. So, let's begin by looking at the essay contest first. There are two contests, but they both have the same topic, and that topic is we all live in a watershed. I want to point out to you that there are some dis differences between an essay and a report. Most of you, I'm sure, have written reports over the years, and those are just a formal presentation of facts. An essay is a little different in that it includes your personal opinion. So we're looking for you to tell us what you think about and what you understand about we all live in a watershed, why that's important. Now, you probably want to do a little research so you, that you have some facts, but what we're looking for is your point of view on the importance of watersheds. So now that we know a little bit of, about what we're looking for in the essay, let's take a look at the rules. Your essay must have the title on it, We All Live in a Watershed. It needs to be written exactly like that. We all live in a watershed. The essay is to be between 300 to 500 words in length. Most of you will find that somewhere between a little over a half a page to about a page in length, but do count your words. Your essay needs to be your own work. We want you to think and present your ideas. Remember, that's what an essay is about. So don't use something you've read on the internet or that you've read in a book or a magazine. Use your own ideas. You are to use eight and a half inch by 11 inch paper. That's regular notebook or rather regular computer paper. You can also choose whether you want to do it in your own handwriting or if you want to type it. Either way is okay. We just ask that if you type it, you use a font that's, and a color that's easy to read. And if you do it in your own handwriting, please use ink. That keeps our essays from getting smudged and helps you to get all the points you deserve. It's very important both for the essay and the poster that you identify yourself on the back of the essay or the poster. What we need there is your name, the name of the school that you go to, that you're in the sixth grade, that you're in Davidson County, and your teacher's name. That's because there are some prizes for the contest, and if you win, we want to be able to find you and get you those prizes. Here's how we will score your essays. Content is worth 50 points. What that's all about is, what are you telling us about we all live in a watershed? Are your facts correct? Do you, does your point of view make sense? Your writing style will be 20 points. And that's what we're looking for there is for you to make your essay interesting and make it something that someone would want to read. The next 20 points come from the organization. What we're looking for there is that your essay has a good introduction, there's a good body to your essay, and then finally there's a good conclusion. The last 10 points are for neatness. Neatness counts whether it's typed or handwritten. Good margins, good spacing, all of that counts to neatness. There are some infractions that we'll take points away for. If your essay is either less than 300 words or more than 500 words in length, that will be minus point, five points. 
if you put the wrong title or if you simply don't put the title on there, that will be minus five points. And if you use the wrong size paper, that will be minus two points. Now let's switch gears over to the poster contest. Remember, the topic is the same for both contests, and that topic is we all live in a watershed. There is a big difference in the poster contest, and that big difference is that the title is not required on your poster. Your poster can have that title, we all live in a watershed, but it doesn't have to. Your poster can be any size up to 24 inches by 36 inches. 24 by 36 inches is regular poster paper, so anything up to that size will work. Your poster must be flat, so don't try to glue things on it that are any thicker than, say, another sheet of paper. Your poster also must be your original work, something that you come up with, not something you've seen somewhere else and that you're adapting to you, but do your own work and be original with it. Our judges will tend to, to score hand-drawn artwork a little higher than they do computer-generated art. You can do either, but just be sure it's your own work, that it's neat, and that it makes sense. We ask that you avoid rolling your posters up. The reason we ask that is if you roll your posters up, they get wrinkled, and then they don't judge as well. They don't look as good for our judges. So we want you to get all the credit you can so keep your posters looking as good as they can until they get to us. It's important, too, that you identify yourself on the back, just as for the essay contest with your name, school, teacher, sixth grade, and that you're in Davidson County. Now, with all that in mind, uh, here's how we will score your poster. What we call the conservation message is worth 50 points. What, what that means is, what are you telling us about we all live in a watershed? Does it make sense? Are the facts correct? All of that is contained in that conservation message. 30 points are given for how visually effective your poster is. What we're looking for there is a poster that catches your eye, that gives you information quickly and information that is easy to understand. That's visual effectiveness. The next 10 points are what we call universal appeal. And all that means is that can someone who is young look at it and understand it? Can someone old look at it and understand it? The, no matter whether you live in the city or in the country or wherever, can you understand and does that a poster attract you to it? The last 10 points are for originality. Originality frequently is the thing that decides who is first place versus who is second place. So use your own ideas because they're the ones that are going to be the best. There are infractions again for the poster contest. If it is oversized, that is minus five points. That means it's larger than 24 by 36 inches. Or if you have copyright violations, that's minus five points. Images, photos often, uh, copyrights protect another person's work. So do your own work. Don't copy something that someone else has done. It's much like plagiarism. If you're using somebody else's work, you're stealing from them. So avoid that to get all your points. So here's how the contest will work from this point going forward. Each school will select one or more of you, the entries to represent the school in the county contest. Teachers will be doing that. They'll select the ones from your classes that will be sent to our office. And we will pick those essays and posters up on December 4th at the school office. That next week, we will announce the winners by December the 11th. Uh, during that week, we'll have a team of judges come in to read your essays, to look at your posters, and they'll select the winners there. And that will bring us to the what a lot of folks seem to think is the most important thing about the contest, and those are the prizes. 
There are prizes for each contest. If you are selected as the winner at your school, as the first place winner, you get a trophy and you will be recognized at your school. You will also be entered into the county level contest to compete with the winners from all the other schools in Davidson County. We will pick a first place winner there. The first place county winner gets a plaque and $25. The first place winner also wins for his teacher or her teacher a $25 gift that will go to the teachers for their work in helping you to be the county winner. If you're the county winner, you go on to the next level of the contest, which we call the area contest. That's uh, 13 counties in our part of the state that will be competing against each other for uh, first, second, and third prize. They haven't told us yet what the prizes will be for this year, but last year, first prize was $25, second prize was $15, and third prize was $10. If you win at the area level contest, you're then entered into the state contest. At the state contest, the first place winner gets $200. The second place winner receives $100. We've been very proud and very fortunate to have had quite a few first and second place winners over the years from Davidson County. And we hope that maybe this is your year to be that winner to win either first or second prize at the state. You'll have to do good work. It'd be hard work but we want to recognize you for being successful. So let's start at this point and we'll move forward learning about why watersheds are important. And we'll be focusing on that topic, we all live in a watershed, to help you understand first what watersheds are, second why they're important, the impacts of something called impervious cover. Impervious cover is just a big word that means a surface that water cannot penetrate through. Could be like a, ro uh, a roof, a road, a parking lot, things that water cannot soak through. Then we'll look at what you can do to help improve our watersheds and what we can do as a community to help protect our watersheds. So this young lady is asking, why should watersheds matter to me? Well, it's important for us to note that watersheds are important to all of us because we all live in a watershed. As we look at our watersheds, there are lots of different people that live there. Folks that are students like you might be, the teachers, the office workers, the fishermen and farmers and construction workers, our grandparents, and then all of us enjoy watersheds for some kind of outdoor recreation, whether we're bicyclists, canoeists, fisher persons, uh, we ride horses, whatever. We all enjoy the good things that watersheds provide for us. Well, you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm still not sure what a watershed is. So let me see if I can help you understand that concept of a watershed. So what is a watershed? A watershed is the area of land that drains to a particular point along a stream. And if we add this drawing to kind of give you an idea of hills and valleys, this is going to compose our watershed. If we add the water to it, you can see maybe a little better how those hills and valleys might work. A watershed is the area that drains to a particular point. Okay, so let's draw a boundary around that watershed, which the white line does for us there. So that area inside of the white lines is all going to drain to the lake that shows up on the lower right-hand portion of your screen. The line just shows the point where if a raindrop falls on one side of the line, it drains to our lake. If it falls on the other side of the line, it's in a different watershed and flows somewhere else. So 
let's draw some arrows on there to show how that water would flow. As you look at those arrows, the arrows indicate that when a drop of water falls, where that drop of water would drain to. But it's important to note that all that water from the upper end all the way down to the lake on the lower side all drains to that one point and that creates a watershed. And remember, we all live in a watershed. No matter where we live in the world, no matter who we are, where we live, and where we are at every moment is in a watershed. Might be very different, but every place on earth is within that watershed, within a watershed. Okay, so maybe now you understand what a watershed is and that you live in a watershed. But what are the kinds of things that can have an impact on your watershed, either for good or bad? Well, one of those things that have a big impact on watersheds is something called impervious cover. Let's take a look at what impervious cover is and the impacts that impervious cover can have on a watershed. So here's a, an aerial photograph of just a community that has impervious surfaces and pervious surfaces. So let's start by looking at what are the impervious surfaces that we can easily pick out here. Well, the first thing we notice here is we've got lots of roads here. The roads and the pavement that goes along with the road do not allow water to soak into the ground. So they are an impervious surface. Very similar to the roads are the parking lots in that area. Often they're paved either with concrete or asphalt that neither of them allow water to soak into the ground. So they're impervious surfaces. We can add buildings in there. Our buildings have roofs that are designed to keep water from soaking into our building. And they also keep that water from soaking into the ground. So they are impervious surfaces. We have sidewalks and walkways around our homes and around our businesses that are impervious surfaces. We have driveways that create impervious surfaces. So as we look at this picture, all those highlighted areas now show how much of this particular picture is covered by an impervious surface. So let's see how those impervious surfaces uh, relate to how much water runs off. Because how much water runs off impacts our streams drastically. And what we want to compare here is a forest versus a parking lot. So you see the forest on the top left, the parking lot on the lower left. In a forest, the rain soaks into the ground and is either taken up by tree roots or soaks into the ground where it becomes groundwater. On a parking lot, when it falls on that impervious surface, it can't soak into the ground, so it becomes something called storm water runoff. It's water that runs off when it rains. And if we compare the, the forested area to the parking lot or other impervious surface, we'll see that it has drastic impacts on the way that the water runs off. Impervious cover creates much, much more storm water runoff than a forest will. Our bar graph here at the, the bottom of the page shows uh, the first column is the rainfall. And this just is assuming that we have roughly two inches of rainfall. Well, when we get that two inches of rainfall on a parking lot, we're estimating that roughly 1.8 inches of that rainfall becomes stormwater runoff and leaves the site. If you look at the bar graph on the far right, in the forest, that runoff is much, much smaller, about, or excuse me, less than two tenths of an inch. So you get most of that water soaking up into the ground where it can become groundwater and where it helps to clean that water that is falling. 
So the amount of impervious cover we have has a big impact on our streams. If we just look at the picture starting at the top left, you'll see a stream there that is in a watershed that has less than 5% impervious surfaces. A very nice looking stream with clean water, probably all kinds of different organisms live in there, but a good quality stream. If we move to the picture in the top center, you see a stream that is in an area where the watershed is roughly 10, 8 to 10% uh, impervious surfaces. And you can see that there's erosion going on on the sides of the stream channel. The water is not as clean looking. And there's some damage to, to that stream. But not like it is if we go over to the one on the right on the top where we have roughly 20% cover in the watershed that is impervious. I want to point out in that picture, you can see the culvert or the pipe that's sticking out over the stream on the right hand side there. And you can see that the stream bank is straight up and down. When that culvert was installed, the bottom of the pipe was on the stream bottom. That stream has eroded down and has eroded to the edges over the years to create a stream that is not very healthy. If we move on down to the picture on the bottom on the right, we see a stream that exists in a, in a watershed that is has about 30% of impervious surfaces covering the watershed. And you can see that the stream is damaged, the stream banks are caving in, trees are falling into the creek. Uh, there are other pollutants in that water there. So the problems and if we continue on to the one on the bottom left, you see a stream that is really no longer a natural stream. It's more, a, more or less a concrete line ditch. That's just a way to pass water from one point to another. So increasing the impervious cover in the watershed increases the damages and the impacts to our streams. So we can see that there really is a relationship between how our streams look and how healthy they are versus the impervious cover that exists in the watershed. But let's take a little closer look to see exactly how that impervious cover affects our stream. Impervious cover can influence a lot of different things. Number one, it can affect dry and wet weather stream flows. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. It also impacts the size and the shape of the stream channel. It will infect, affect, excuse me, it will affect the quality of the water in our stream. It will, and that quality of water along with all the other things also impacts our plant and animal habitat. So impervious cover greatly influences the quality of our streams. So let's take a closer look. Impervious cover has a huge influence on both dry and wet weather. Let's f look first at wet, or excuse me, dry weather flow in the stream. Uh, you may have wondered in the past how streams continue to flow in the summertime here when the weather has been dry for weeks or maybe even months. Well, the answer to that question is because there is a vast amount of water stored in the soil. We call that groundwater. And our streams depend on that groundwater to continue to flow during dry periods. If we live in a watershed where there are many, many acres of impervious surfaces, those impervious surfaces do not allow water to soak into the ground where it can become groundwater. If it can't become groundwater, it can't nourish the stream, keep the stream flowing during dry weather. So we see much, much lower flows in our stream during dry weather in watersheds that have high percentages of impervious surfaces. Impervious cover changes the wet weather stream flows. When it rains on impervious surfaces, you get a large amount of water running off. And we can kind of trace this a little bit here to our stream. 
The water that falls on our roofs might run off through a gutter, down a downspout, onto a paved parking lot, out into the street that you see there in the center. It enters the storm drain system there where it goes to a pipe that's directed straight to the stream. Many people have the wrong impression that the, the uh, storm drain system goes to a treatment plant, but that's not the case. Anything that goes down that storm drain goes directly into our creek, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. That impervious cover greatly increases the chance of more frequent flooding and higher flood levels. You might have noticed over the last year more frequent flooding and bigger flooding in our area. Part of that is that has been partially due to increased rainfall in the last year or two, but one of the key factors is being that as Davidson County continues to grow, we get more and more impervious surfaces that lead to larger amounts of stormwater reaching our streams much more quickly, and that causes us damage. So let's look a little further in that as to how it affects the stream shape and size. When you get large volumes of storm water runoff from those impervious areas, it begins to damage the banks of our stream channel. Streams uh, in a natural, undamaged condition will have gently sloping banks on either side. That's not what exists in the stream that you see in the picture there. Those stream banks are eroding. That puts sediment in the water. You might not know what sediment is, but sediment is soil particles that end up in the water. And that just so happens to be the largest pollutant that we have in the water by volume in the state of North Carolina. So we're damaging the stream channel, creating pollution by sediment. That sediment sometimes covers up the bottom of the stream, making the stream more shallow. It also covers up the habitat for some of those creatures that live on the bottom of the stream. As the streams get shallow, as the banks erode, because of the rapid flow and larger flow of water, quite often the stream channel becomes much more straighter. Nature intends for streams to meander, to to weave back and forth. That's the way they control the flow and the energy of the water in the stream. So when we create impervious areas, we create even more damage to those streams because we straighten them out. There's also pollutants that come from these impervious, area, impervious surfaces. Uh, you can see construction there on the top left and the soil particles that will wash off the, the roadway into our waterways. Pay attention when you go to the gas station with your parents the next time. You might see gasoline, oil, antifreeze all spilled out. And when it rains there, guess what? That all washes right into our streams. Take a look when you're in the parking lot next time. You'll probably see trash scattered about the parking lot. When it rains, that water washes that trash directly into our streams where they become significant pollutants. There are various kinds of pollutants that can be very harmful in that stormwater runoff. One of those things is bacteria. Now the glass that this fellow is holding up here is kind of cloudy looking, but quite often when ba bacteria is the pollutant, the water still looks clean, but it could sure make you sick. We often see fish kills that are caused by things like nutrient pollution, pesticides, oil and grease. Nutrients are excess fertilizers that end up in our water. When you fertilize the yard, when you fertilize your garden, if you're putting too much out, you're probably damaging our streams. Muddy water. I mentioned that this a slide or two ago, the number one pollutant in our water in the state of North Carolina is something called sediment. When you see muddy water, you're seeing sediment in the water. So muddy water equals polluted water. And then last, 
There can be heavy metals in our water, like zinc, copper, and lead. A good example here in Davidson County is mercury. We used to have a battery factory here in, in Davidson County that used mercury to make the batteries. Well, they improperly disposed of some of that mercury that ended up getting into High Rock Lake. So for many years at High Rock Lake, they used to have signs like this health advisory you see that would say that you should not eat more than a certain amount of fish that were caught in High Rock Lake every week to stay safe. Impervious service changes the habitat quality for all those creatures that live in our streams. You can think about all those things from fish and turtles and, and crawdads on and on and on. When we have that sediment deposited in our streams, it covers up places where those creatures that live on the bottom that start the food chain live. When we have the stream channel being straightened and the, everything being flushed out, we lose the variety of habitat or the diversity of habitat that is so important to supporting a wide variety of animals. And very frequently, when we get more impervious cover, we lose what we call a stream buffer. That's just a place where plants grow on either side of the stream. As those buffers get more and more narrow, we get more damage to the habitat for the creatures that live in the stream. So, what does all that mean for the future of stream? Well, it's not doom and gloom. If we are careful, we can improve all our streams or protect those that are already in good. So let's start by looking at a stream that's already in good shape. We'd call this a sensitive stream. We find these streams in uh, watersheds where the impervious cover is less than 10%. You can see that's a good looking stream with good clean water. So if we were being a stream doctor, we'd say the diagnosis is this is a healthy stream with good water quality and it can support a lot of different aquatic life. Our prescription for taking care of it would be to protect that stream. We may even want to do things that would conserve or protect it from development around the stream to help that stream stay healthy. If we looked at a stream that has more impervious cover, this one happens to have around 10 to 25% impervious cover, we would call that an impacted stream. And you can see the differences here where the, there's stream bank erosion, you can see the sediments in the stream channel. So our diagnosis there would be that uh, it's not great shape, but we have lots of streams in Davidson County that look like this. Now they can still support a lot of different aquatic organisms, but they're gonna need some help to be able to do that. So our prescription is that we need to protect these areas, but we also probably need to use something called best management practices to help increase the infiltration in the watershed and increase the filtration to keep the pollutants out of the stream to keep it healthy for the animals that live there. If we go on to a stream that has further impacts like this severely damaged stream here, that it, the picture comes from a watershed where about uh, 50 or 60 percent of the, the watershed has impervious cover. Our diagnosis doesn't look nearly as good. We see highly eroded channels, poor water quality, not a lot of uh, aquatic organisms living there, and very limited uses. Probably not very good for fishing, not good for swimming, so limited uses. So what do we do here? What's our diet prescription? is to go in and carefully treat and restore those areas, being good stewards to help improve the water quality and the habitat. Now, the most seriously, seriously damaged streams, some of them may have reached a point where there's not much we can do for them. A stream like this that is being converted to a concrete line channel, our diagnosis is pretty poor. We can diagnose that it's highly mod modified, doesn't look much like a natural channel, doesn't provide much habitat, 
and it's probably not going to support human uses like fishing. So what can we do there? Well, the best thing that we can do is to try to prevent pollution of that water so that the water that flows through this stream will be as clean as possible when it gets down to a more natural stream channel so that we have as good a water quality as we can hope for. So we've seen that impervious cover impacts watersheds in a lot of different ways. How can we work together to protect our watersheds? Let's take a look at that uh, through a process of addressing watershed damage as a community. The group that helped put this together, the Center for Watershed Pro Protection, uses eight different tools to address watershed protection. And the first tool is to use watershed planning. And all that is, is basically looking at what you have in your watershed, what's good, what's bad, where the good is, where the bad is, and then making a plan for that. This may be the most important tool when it comes to protecting a watershed is evaluating what you have so that you can make plans to Because when we're looking at our watersheds and trying to address it, it's much like putting together a puzzle. We've got all these different uses. People need a place to live. They need a place to shop. They need a place to work. And they need a place for recreation. So how do we make all those pieces fit together in the best way for our watershed so that we continue to have good, healthy watersheds and good water quality? That evaluation leads to developing watershed plans that look at the conditions, what can be done, what can't be done, and then a plan for how to address the issues that exist in our watershed. Those plans usually end up with maps that look like this. The black line indicates our watershed. The blue lines are the streams and the lakes within that watershed. The green area ref, uh, represents buffers that exist. The hatched green areas are where we're gonna add buffers. So it shows things that places where we need to take action. That's what the plan is all about, creating a place that is going to be good for our stream as it outflows. The second tool in that toolbox is conserving certain areas. We want to keep the most important and most vulnerable parts of the watershed protected. There can be a variety of different conservation areas. There can be things like wetlands that we see there as the critical habitats. It could be the areas along our streams and rivers. We call those aquatic corridors. It might be forest land and farmland. It might be areas where there are pollution hazards. And it might even be something man-made, a cultural area, something like maybe Old Salem in Winston-Salem. That's important to our history to protect those areas. The third tool is to look at where we might use an aquatic buffer. Those are just places where you're changing from dry land to the waterway. The benefits of those buffers include things like flood control, increased property values, have creating habitat for wildlife, providing protection for wetlands that are important for wildlife, and reducing pollutants. The buffers here are very different. Although this is a nice looking home on the top picture, that lawn uh, between the house and the water body doesn't provide much protection. Where, on the other hand, the home in the bottom picture, the grown up area along the water serves as a great filter, provides a lot of uh, habitat for wildlife, and really, really helps to protect our water. On the farm, there's lots of different things we can do. The farmer in the top left picture is not doing such a great job because he's working the land right up to the water course. A much better way to treat that is seen below where you see the grasses and the shrubs growing up along the stream. And then on the right hand side of the uh, screen, 
that shows an excellent stream. Remember we talked about meanders earlier. You can see the stream weaving back and forth, surrounded by trees and shrubs and grasses that can filter out any of the pollutants that might come from the farmland. Tool number four is to utilize better site designs. That means reducing the amount of impervious cover however we can. That leads to better residential and commercial development. In a conventional development, we might see homes scattered out evenly, all the trees removed. And in newer uh, development designs like cluster subdivisions, the houses are closer together, but there are areas of trees and shrubs left to protect the watershed. In those areas, we need to manage that rooftop runoff. While it's not too good to just let the water run off down the downspout, across the parking lot, into the stream, it's much better to create areas where we can encourage the water to soak into the ground, or maybe where we even collect the water in something like a rain barrel to capture that water where we can use it later. That prevents runoff and gives us water for various other uses. The fifth tool is to control erosion and sediment. That's a key during the construction process for protecting our streams. There are various best management practices that we can use to do that. Things like silt fences that you see on the top left, hydro seeding, which is a mixture of seed and a tacky material that holds the soil in place until the grasses can grow through it. We might use things like the rock check dams you see on the left bottom or sediment basins on the right bottom that are designed to capture the water from a construction site, allow the sediment to, to filter out, and then allow clean water to go downstream. Tool number eight is to manage that storm water, the water, water that runs off. And we can use, do that by using best management practices like ponds, wetlands, grass channels, ways to increase infiltration, and ways to filter the water. Here are a couple of examples of those stormwater best management practices. Those might be things like ponds that you see on the top left, or wetlands like you see on the top right. Wetlands are just shallow areas with, uh, covered by water uh, that grow a diversity of plants, and they're really good at controlling storm water. You might utilize open grass channels like you see on the bottom left, or infiltration areas. On the right bottom, the area that looks light colored is filled with gravel. It was just a big pit that was dug to capture the water that runs off a parking lot and then the gravel allows that water to soak into the soil slowly and prevent runoff. Tool number seven is to look at other pollution sources. Those can be things like septic systems, which is how we dispose of our wastewater from our houses here in Davidson County, uh, sanitary sewer systems, industrial discharges, and confined animal feeding lots. And you'll see some examples of those here. Uh, improperly managed animal waste can be a pollutant. Luckily, here in Davidson County, our farmers are doing a great job of trying to keep our water clean from animal waste. We've done a good job of addressing discharges from pipes, like you see on the top right. The health department has worked hard to improve the septic conditions of septic systems throughout the county, and has also worked to prevent those storms, uh, excuse me, those sanitary sewers which dispose of human waste from overflowing during heavy storms. Tool number eight is where you get involved and that's watershed stewardship. Speaking up about the importance of the watershed, maintaining it by doing things like picking up trash or monitoring the quality of the stream, or maybe even going in and help to, helping to restore a stream or some portion of a watershed. But the real key thing is education here, knowing what to do and what not to do. That's the key to being a good steward of the water. 
Now, you might be saying to yourself, you know, I don't run a factory, I don't litter, I don't control development, I'm only one person. So what can I do to make a difference? Well, I'm going to give you a list of 10 things that you can do to help make a difference. On my top 10 list, number one is to use only water for watering outside when and where it's really needed. Particularly in our lawns, we waste a lot of water. And that becomes a double problem because we frequently over-fertilize and overuse pesticides in our lawns. So using only the amount of pesticides and fertilizers we need, only water and when and where it's needed, are first good steps. The third step is to be smart when we plant around our homes and to use native vegetation. Those are plants that are adapted to our local conditions that require less fertilizer, less pesticides, and less water. Number four on our list is to manage that rooftop runoff. Create ways to either collect it or to cause it to soak into the ground. Number five is to properly dispose of our pet waste. In Davidson County, that proper disposal means you pick up after Rover and you throw it in the trash. Number six is to be smart with where you wash your car. Our best choice is to use car washes where they recycle the water. But if you're washing at home, wash it on the lawn so that the water can soak back into the ground where it can be cleaned up. And that water can also serve to, to water your lawn. Number seven is to properly maintain vehicles. Next time you're out in a parking lot, take a look. I bet you'll find spots where oil, gasoline, antifreeze, or other chemicals have leaked out of those vehicles onto the ground. We can prevent that. Number eight is to recycle and properly dispose of household chemicals. Uh, too many folks seem to think that disposing of household chemicals means to just dump them down the drain. That's not the best way to do it. Our landfill has a, a, a day every month where they collect those household chemicals and dispose of them properly. Number nine is to properly maintain your septic system. A lot of folks don't know that you really need to have your septic system pumped out every three to five years to keep it functioning properly and to keep it from polluting the environment around it. Number 10, and the most important of all of these, is for you to get involved, to learn more about your watersheds and what's unique about it. Find out what's planned for the future for your watershed and then be involved in what's going on in your watershed in the future. That's what we hope you'll take away from today as you think about we all live in a watershed. We hope that you'll give that a lot of thought. We wish you good luck as you prepare your essays and posters. And again, if you have questions that your teachers can't answer, please have them contact me and I'll help you the best that I can. Good luck. And remember, we all live in a watershed.